Hello there and welcome to Shots in the Quark. In this episode we're going to begin our journey through quantum mechanics, the physics of the microscopic world. These days the word quantum is thrown around quite a bit, like a boat on a stormy sea. If you've ever seen Ant-Man, you may think that the quantum world is a colourful, trippy place. If you've ever come across Schrodinger's cat, then you may think that quantum means that animals can be dead and alive at the same time. The pictures people paint of quantum mechanics can make it seem fascinatingly bizarre, or perhaps crazy and unbelievable. But quantum mechanics is one of the foundational pillars of modern physics, and it accurately describes the behaviour of our world. In this series, I want to show you why modern physics is built on this strange theory. I want to paint a picture of quantum mechanics that explores its weird and wonderful side whilst remaining true to the proper content of the theory and why it must apply to our world. In this episode, we're going to take a look at a particular model of the atom originally proposed by one of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics, Niels Bohr. This model arose as a solution to a catastrophe, namely that the physics of the time predicted that all atoms should spontaneously collapse and disintegrate. Let's take a closer look at this historic problem. The development of quantum mechanics is a somewhat messy story, but there's a clear problem that demonstrates what the heart of quantum theory is and why we needed it. In the early 20th century, experiments had shown that atoms had a rather peculiar structure. Most of the mass in the atom and all of the positive charge was squeezed into a tiny centre of protons and neutrons, orbited by negatively charged electrons at a comparably large distance. These experiments seem to suggest that atoms mirror our solar system, with the protons and neutrons packed into a tiny star-like nucleus, and the electrons like planets in their orbits. The problem with this, however, is that this picture of the atom made absolutely no sense. It could not be explained by the physics of the time. At the start of the 20th century, the only forces people really knew about were gravity and electromagnetism, and neither of these forces could be used to explain why atoms had this structure. In fact, the situation was quite a bit worse than that. The laws of electromagnetism predicted something very worrying about how structures such as atoms should behave. If you think about the atom as a positively charged nucleus being orbited by negatively charged electrons, then the laws of electromagnetism predict that this atom will collapse before you've had a chance to blink. Planets can orbit the sun without falling in, but this is because their motion is dictated by the laws of gravitation. The same is not true for a planetary system based on electromagnetism. The problem comes from the fact that accelerated charges release energy in the form of radiation. If you have an electron orbiting a nucleus, then that electron is an accelerating charge. Motion in anything other than a straight line is accelerated motion, and so if the electron really is orbiting the nucleus, then the electron is always accelerating. But if the electron is always accelerating, then it must always be emitting radiation. But this is disastrous. If the electron is always emitting radiation, then it is always losing energy. As the electron loses this energy, it orbits closer and closer to the nucleus, until finally it hits it. The laws of electromagnetism then predicted that all electrons should immediately spiral into their nuclei and atoms should spontaneously collapse. If this isn't a disaster, what is? If electromagnetism predicts that all atoms should collapse, then there must be something new that explains why this doesn't happen. There must be some new physics that applies to the microscopic world and prevents this kind of collapse. It would take a while for the full picture to be understood, and the full theory of quantum mechanics is a difficult theory to get your head around. But there was a temporary solution to this problem, devised by Neil Bohr, and it's fairly easy to grasp intuitively, and it encompasses one of the key aspects of quantum theory. It is Bohr's model of the atom, which we'll be taking a look at in this video. In 1924, another founding father of quantum mechanics, Louis de Broglie, suggested that ordinary particles like electrons had some wave-like properties. It had already been observed that in some situations, electrons behave like waves, and in others they behave like particles. De Broglie suggested a relationship between the wavelength of a particle and its momentum, and this relationship was backed up by diffraction experiments. This wave-particle duality relation was 
actually proposed over a decade after Bohr's model of the atom, but one of the assumptions Bohr made in his model makes a lot more sense if we already accept wave-particle duality. So although it's not historically accurate, we're going to pretend that Bohr knew about this relationship. This wave-particle duality gets us thinking. What if the electron behaves like a wave inside the atom? Suppose that we have an atom with the nucleus in the center and an electron in a circular orbit around it. If the electron is a wave, then it has a wavelength, which we'll call lambda. Now we can represent the electron in its orbit as a wave, but what we need to be careful of is that the endpoints of this wave match up. Otherwise, we could get a discontinuity. So we need to make sure that these endpoints match up and the condition for this to be the case is that the circumference of this circle is an integer multiple of the wavelength. So because these endpoints need to match up, we get a relation between the circumference of the orbit and the wavelength of the electron. We must have that two times pi times r, where r is the orbital radius, must be equal to some integer, some positive integer n, times the wavelength of the electron lambda. At this point, we remember that de Broglie has given us a very useful relationship between the wavelength of a particle and its momentum. So we can write down a new relation, 2 pi r is equal to n h over mv. h is the Planck constant, and m is the mass of the particle, and v is its velocity. Okay, so now let's put our classical mechanics hats back on. In classical mechanics, if something is in a circular orbit, then we must have a centripetal force, which is given by mv squared divided by r. Okay. Now, in this case, it's the electric force which is providing our centripetal force. And so this mv squared over r has got to be equal to the Coulomb force, which if we assume that we've got one electron and one proton in the nucleus, we have e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon naught r squared. Using a bit of algebra, we can combine the red relation and the blue relation to obtain expressions for the momentum and for the radius separately. It's here that we see one of the central tenets of quantum mechanics come to light. This n here is a positive integer only, and it's the only thing that we can vary in these equations. The rest of these letters and numbers are all just constants. What this tells us is that electrons can't just orbit at any old radius, and they can't just have any old momentum either. They can only orbit at very specific distances, and they can only take certain values of momentum. We say that the orbits and the momentum of the electron have become quantized. There are only a discrete, not a continuous set of them. By introducing these discrete orbits, the problem of collapsing atoms has been solved. We shouldn't expect atoms just to collapse in on themselves because an electron can't just spiral continuously into the nucleus. An electron can jump between these orbits only if it receives or radiates the precise amount of energy it needs to do so. An electron also can't just fall into the nucleus because there's a smallest possible orbit, namely when n is equal to 1 in this equation. Once the electron falls into this lowest orbit, it can't get any closer to the nucleus. Bohr's model explains why electrons don't just spiral into the nucleus. Now, Bohr's model, in every sense, is completely wrong. It's a strange mix of classical Newtonian physics and quantum relationships which aren't strictly consistent with one another. But it was an important step in the development of quantum theory in three respects. Firstly, it solved a problem that classical mechanics couldn't. Second, it introduced the idea of quantization into the model of the atom. And thirdly, this model produced pretty good predictions for what the spectrum of a hydrogen atom should look like. No other theory had come close to achieving this, and so the quantum ideas Bohr used gained massive experimental support. Even though Bohr's model is technically wrong, it conveys the need for quantum theory and introduces the key concepts involved. Quantization is one of the central messages of quantum theory. On the microscopic scale, the world isn't classical, smooth, and continuous. It's discrete, it's granular, and things come in packets of fixed size. In future videos, we'll journey beyond this central message and we'll realize that quantum mechanics gets a lot more weird.
But for now, we start with the basics. And the basic message is that on its smallest scales, the world is discrete. And we know that this must be the case since classical mechanics fails to describe the world at microscopic scales. Thank you very much for watching and I hope you enjoyed. Please like and subscribe for more Shots in the Quark.